Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the City of Grand Prairie's Franchise U first session, Franchising 101. I am so excited to have a representative here from FranNet to provide us some information on franchising. Please take note that every Thursday of this month, we will be focusing on franchising. Next week, we will have the legal essentials to uh, franchising followed by funding your franchise and then on june 29th we will have an in-person um, opportunity for you to come out and meet and chat with franchisees and franchisers so with no further delay i'm going to hand it over to miss wasco that's your name right miss wasco hi uh, it is sarah wasco you were very close um, and my niece says uh we say it like costco so okay um, <laughs> i like that i like that <laughs> easy to remember just no t in there so thank you very much Kay, for inviting me to speak um i love talking about franchising um i am a franchisee myself with FranNet of dallas fort worth and oklahoma and actually, I am going on 11 years now in the industry. Uh, it'll be 11 years in August. I was fortunate to serve on the FranNet Advisory Committee. And so I was the liaison between franchisees and franchisors and learned a lot while I was doing that. Prior to joining FranNet, I uh, was in the sales and consulting role for small business owners. So I learned a lot just about small business ownership through that. Um, in addition to my FranNet franchise, we also own four gyms uh, in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex. So it's a total of seven territories between uh, my FranNet franchise and our gym franchises. And I have lived in this area since 1987. I have a colleague that works with me, and her name is Roxanne Ratsky. She came to franchising after 20 years in the mortgage banking industry. Uh, she has been in the franchise consulting world for 16 years, uh, been with FranNet for 10 years, and also uh, was previously a franchisee with a men's closing franchise, and also was co-authored a book, From Boots to Business, um, related to veterans and franchising. So what we are going to chat about today is why would somebody want to go into business uh, for themselves? What are your options for business ownership? And we'll talk about some of the differences between starting from scratch, uh, buying an existing business and buying a franchise. What are the risk and rewards for those opportunities? We'll talk about some myths and some facts about franchising and then how to build your business model and find uh, an opportunity that could be the best option for you. Just a little bit about FranNet and who we are. We are franchise matchmakers. FranNet has been around actually since 1987. We have around 100 locally based consultants, both in the US and Canada. And we also have national partnerships with SCORE and the Small Business Development Center. And these are divisions of the SBA. So if you are thinking about business ownership, I highly encourage that you reach out to SCORE and the Small Business Development Centers. Their services are at no cost. SCORE uh, mentors are volunteers. Many of them are retired, but many of them are still employed and they volunteer their time. They have experts with a million different backgrounds. Um, so whatever you might need help with, I'm sure there is somebody with experience in that area uh, that volunteers their time to uh, assist you. And then the Small Business Development Center is uh, also a division of the SBA. They are advisors and their services are paid um, through your tax dollars. And they have uh, a lot of resources for you as well. All right. Um, like those uh, organizations, FranNet services are free to our clients as well. So what we do, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is we are matchmakers. And so we provide education just like this today. We love talking about franchising and helping uh, people understand the franchise industry. I was chatting with Kay before we got started here, um, and we really believe that franchising is the most overlooked and misunderstood form of business ownership. We are not... Uh, 
franchise salespeople. We're not trying to convince or persuade anyone. We are here to facilitate due diligence so that prospective business owners can make uh, informed decisions. We have a database of franchisors that we work with that are pre-screened. So we do not match all franchises um, with prospects. We have about 150 to 200 that we work with. Um, we also have partnerships with multiple lending companies and the lending environment is changing dramatically. And so it's really important that you are educated in this area as well. And so we have uh, these companies listed here that we partner with and we have confidence in. So if you need help with lending uh, for a franchise, we'll be happy to make those introductions as well. So I am going to kind of, I might, hopefully I'm not going too fast. I saw that Kay had made a note that you could put questions in Q&A. So I would love for this to be interactive, uh, but I'm also wanting to be respectful of our one hour time. And usually this does take about an hour um, to get through. So hopefully I will be going at a good speed to keep you interested, uh, but not too fast. So think just for a minute. That, and imagine that you're the owner of a successful business. How do you think your life might be different or how might it be better? Kind of think about what it is that's drawing you to learn about franchise ownership. I'll give you just a second to kind of think about what it might be that's attracting you to owning a business. So here are some of the responses that I often get when I'm in a room of people that are, um, you know, verbally providing me answers. And I really want you to take this time to think about what it is that success means to you. Success means different things to different people. And most of the time, people are seeking some combination of these uh, blocks here. It's not just a one uh, answer scenario. But what I'm hearing from a lot of people these days is wanting some flexibility, wanting some control over their own time. Um, many of our clients are seeking uh, fulfillment in their work. I hear people tell me pretty regularly that they feel like they're just kind of going through the motions and really not making a contribution. So think about what it is uh, that success means to you and what you seek are seeking to accomplish through business ownership. And when you think about those things and all the positives of those things, it's kind of interesting to really note that most people do choose to work for somebody else. So that brings up the next question. Why would that be? Why are people seeking some of these items that we just discussed through owning a business, but they still end up working for someone else. And here are some of the common concerns and responses that I will often hear. Of course, starting a business can be risky. Absolutely, a job can feel safer than a business. And right now, there's a lot of talk about the economy and recession. So maybe people are just wanting to wait uh, and see if the economy gets better. Um, certainly, money is a factor. Uh, a business can cost money, of course, to start and run. So people might think, why do I want to make that investment to start my own business? And I might just stay at my job and continue earning my salary. Um, the others are knowledge and skills. You know, I don't really know if I know where to start um, to find what I'm looking for. Uh, and what talents and skills might I have to run that business? I know I absolutely felt that way when I started with BrandNet back in 2012. Um, I had been working for a website and online marketing firm. I had been there for six years and I kind of thought, you know, that's all I really know. So if I'm going to start a business, maybe uh, it would need to be in that field. But yet I was getting a little burned out in that field. So I thought, how? would I be able to run a business without having experience in a certain industry? So we will talk about that here shortly. So I think this is a conversation that's really important and it's regarding risk perception of a job. 
Um, a lot of times people do feel like a job is safe. And generally in the short term, that is the case. Uh, employers invest a lot of time um, bringing on the right candidates and maybe even money. They might fly you out somewhere for interviews. I know quite a few people uh, that I've spoken with that have been looking for a job have had multiple interviews with a company. So in the short term, yes, you generally can be sure that your job is safe. But unfortunately, sometimes over time, um, things start to change. Companies get acquired. There seems to be a lot of private equity acquisitions now. So things happen out of your control. Um, certainly, um, performance does not always determine security. Um, and I see people that are changing jobs you know, every two to three years. And so you have to stop and think, are you going to be able to meet your long-term financial goals of security and retirement, making those frequent changes. But don't think that owning a business isn't risky either. It's certainly risky to own a business as well, and I'm not here to tell you otherwise. But the nice thing is nobody's going to take it away from you. You're not going to be downsized. And the only way you're going to be fired is if you choose to fire yourself. Um, you can truly grow the business at the pace that you want. Um, if you decide to explore franchises and start talking to franchisees, uh, you will learn that there are some top performers, some average performers, some lower performers. And that may not necessarily be um, because they're failing or struggling. It really could just be that they're content at the level that they are because Back to that other slide and what success mean, maybe they're looking for more time with family and not as interested in investing uh, as much time to growing that business financially as somebody else might be. There are no 100% scenarios, but generally, the longer you own that business, the safer it can become because you have built a reputation. Hopefully you have longevity with your employees. So over time, um, businesses tend to have more staying power. So if you're concerned about how the economy might impact your business, you can lower that risk by looking for businesses with specific market characteristics. Now, what on earth does that actually even mean? Let's talk about some industries that have been proven to thrive in all economic conditions. And one thing that is important to note is we're now a good solid two years out of, of COVID. And so franchisors have solid data to be able to recognize and uh, evaluate how their brands did during that difficult time. And these are some of the industries that have continued to thrive, have been around for a long time, and um, are not as dependent on the economy. And we'll just start off with senior care. I mean, people are continuing uh, to age, the baby boomers are um, hitting the age of 65 at a rate to seven to 10,000 uh, per day. Um, they're going to need services. So services geared towards the aging population are continuing to grow. And they range anywhere from just companion, grocery shopping, self-care, all the way up to um independent living facilities, nursing homes, hospice care. So there's a very wide range of services geared towards seniors. Um, home repairs did very well during COVID. People during that time were spending time at home and so they wanted to make improvements. During um, the big boom in the real estate industry the last year or so, People were making improvements there to get ready to sell or maybe in their new home. And now that that has slowed down, people are continuing to improve and deciding to stay put. So really, those have done quite well. Cleaning services have been around a long time, um, somewhat driven by demographics from the perspective of the older folks 
either can't or just don't want to do that anymore. And the younger families are busy. A lot of times both parents are working, um, children are busy in activities, and that's something that they're going to outsource. That's something that they're going to pay somebody to do so they that they're not using their minimal free time, um, family time to be cleaning house. Then there are also essential services. We drive everywhere uh, here in Texas, very limited public transportation. So we've got to keep our cars up and running. Um, believe it or not, beauty uh, has continued to thrive. I believe with more Zoom, people are being more conscientious about their looks. And then certainly health and wellness kind of uh, falls into that category as well. Skincare and uh, fitness, people are starting to take better care of themselves because they realize the importance of that. Another big one that has been around a long time that's going to continue to thrive is damage restoration. These are the folks that come in and restore homes and businesses after uh, maybe a weather-related incident. We all know about the crazy uh, ice mageddon, snow mageddon that we've had, and some of the storms that we get, um, those types of things. Many people had a lot of damage and had to get um, their homes repaired um, over the last few years due to some of our weather incidents. And then certainly even more unfortunate things, like it might be a tornado or maybe a fire. Those are high dollar projects that are covered by insurance and are going to continue to thrive. Um, sign companies were deemed essential. During COVID, businesses were having to make a lot of changes, needed a lot of signage. I've placed several clients in sign companies over the last couple of years. We talked about residential cleaning. We also have commercial cleaning. Uh, businesses were having to make sure and follow extreme cleaning protocols during COVID. If you've got a business that individuals are working in and you've got customers or clients coming in and out, you have got to keep that business clean. So that is, again, deemed essential. And then there are businesses that help other businesses. So you've got coaching, marketing, digital marketing grew significantly during COVID. People had to figure out how to market their businesses differently when they couldn't go anywhere. Um, staffing companies, they're continuing to thrive. People are hiring and they're, they're utilizing staffing companies to help them find the right individuals for the right jobs. Um, and certainly employee training and sales training. There are a lot of companies that are outsourcing some of their services. So in addition to sales training, they might have um, a fractional CMO, like um, a chief marketing officer, a fractional chief financial officer, HR. So there are businesses that serve other businesses. And during a down economy, when businesses may not have that person full time, those fractional positions are continuing to be utilized. You know, another thing is pets. I don't remember the statistics, but a very large number of households, uh, I think it's in the, at least in the 70s, maybe even higher percent have pets. And many of those have more than one pet. So they're always going to need care. Lawns are going to need care. We already talked about senior citizens and the services that they need. Um, we talked about business to business services. I um, am here to tell you that mosquitoes are not going away. I uh, got into some mosquitoes or chiggers or something over the weekend and I'm still suffering from that. And they don't really care what the economy is. Uh, they are going to be here. So businesses that uh, uh, treat pests are gonna be around for a long time as well. Also businesses that serve children. There has been uh, a lot of talk and there's some education franchises geared around STEM and STEAM, but there are now some geared towards more creative uh, learning, coding, um, and now there's some geared towards physical fitness and dance for children. And those are franchises and don't necessarily need brick and mortar. So people are going to continue to invest no matter what their financial situation might be in their children and certainly in their pets. 
So we're going to move on now to talking about the different ways to start a business. You can start from scratch, you can buy an existing business, or you can buy a franchise. And why might someone choose to do one over the other? And let me check this. Um, when you say staffing, is that strictly temp staffing or is it direct, or is direct staffing thriving as well? Great question, both. Um, temporary, uh, people might need somebody for projects or short, short term. They might be um, on a like a trial scenario, like a temp um, to hire perm as well, but certainly like recruiting and permanent staffing as well. So great question. All right, so let's talk about why somebody might start a business from scratch and what are some of the advantages of that. First of all, you get to make all the decisions and you have that control. So you can be creative. You're not under anybody else's rules. You get to create the rules. And so a lot of people view that as a large upside because they're able to build a business from their passion. But when I speak to independent business owners, while all of that sounds, you know, great, you also have to keep in mind that while you get to do those, you actually have to do those things as well. You must create the systems. You have to figure those things out. Um, unfortunately, because there could be some trial and error involved in some of these decisions, um, your ramp up could be slower. So in other words, um, if you're making some mistakes, stubbing your toe, uh, your, your ramp up could be slower. And so that can lead potentially to a higher failure rate because it might take you longer to get to break even. Um, there are limited financial options as well because you might go in to a lending institution and tell them about your great idea, but if they don't have any facts or any historical data, to base a decision on, it could be a difficult loan to, to get. And because of that higher failure rate, it's a little bit of a catch-22. The higher failure rate is because a lot of times businesses are undercapitalized, but then they don't want to give you a loan because of the higher failure rate. So let's move on to buying an existing business. So a lot of people view this as a very attractive way to get into business, and it absolutely can be. You can move into a business that is up and running. People like the fact that there could be positive cash flow. Uh, if you go to a lender, you're going to have actual financial results to provide them. And so it can be easier to get a loan. Lenders feel more comfortable with that. Hopefully you're going to have an established market. You'll have customers, you'll have employees. Those systems will be in place. And there are times that owners are even open to an owner financing arrangement. So these are all some things that can make buying an existing business very attractive. However, some of those things can also be disadvantages. So first of all, hopefully there's positive cash flow, but there may not be. The reason that they're selling could be that they, they're struggling and they have negative cash flow. And sometimes it can be difficult to go in and maybe turn a business around. That could be harder than maybe starting from scratch. If it's been run poorly, there might be bad reviews, there might be bad will. So that's something else that you might need to work hard to help people understand that it's not the way it used to be and improvements are being made. So that can sometimes be a difficult turnaround uh, to get the word out about your improvements. The business might be overpriced. Um, if somebody has built a business from their passion, it's their baby, um, oftentimes there may be more goodwill factored into that pricing. So you're going to want to make sure you get a proper business valuation. And you also really want to make sure that there are no hidden seller motives, that you have a good understanding of why this business is for sale. And what I mean by that is maybe whatever industry it is, there's a pending 
change in the law. And maybe that could be detrimental to your business if that law um, were to pass. So you want to make sure and do your homework and do your due diligence about the industry and the brand and the business the best that you can uh, before moving forward. While hopefully you're going to have employees and good and the right employees, you also may not. So I mentioned that we own four gyms and we acquired two of them from the previous owner and unfortunately ended up letting all of those employees go because they were not adhering to the culture that my husband was looking to create. Um, that was a lot of the reason that the business had been struggling was poor management and kind of letting things slide with the employees that my husband wasn't willing to let slide as the new owner. So sometimes you actually have to go in and clean house. And you also just want to make sure that there are no surprises when it comes to debt service and make sure that you have a good understanding of the financials with that business. Um, kind of tying in with it being overpriced. I'll never forget a client that I worked with and he was actually my next door neighbor and it was about 10 years ago. And he was really wanting to buy a glass company. And um, essentially he had a CPA and it was actually one of the advisors at the Small Business Development Center assisting him with the business valuation. And the numbers did not line up. And he shared with me that the seller had told him, oh, well, that's because we have some cash sales. Oh, okay. So how do you, in your effort to, I'm sure his um, strategy was to try to save on taxes. In that effort, uh, you really turn around and, uh, you know, shoot yourself in the foot because you don't have the correct documentation when you're ready to sell. So I don't really know how that ended up. My neighbor did not move forward with the business, uh, but that's something that if there's shady book work going on, you really want to do your best to get all the right data and facts because it's really not to your advantage to be hiding things like that um, when it comes time to sell your business. So you can also buy a franchise. And I know that's what we're here to learn about today. Uh, so what makes a franchise advantageous? Well, the first one here, and I always, always feel like it's a little bit of a caveat, is name recognition and a licensed trademark. Well, let me tell you, there's nearly 4,000 franchises out there. So they're not all going to have name recognition. When we opened our gyms, they had been around since, um, let me think, we signed in 2017, I think they'd been around 15, 16, 17 years at that point. I think they started like in 1999, so maybe 18 years. Anyway, no, none of them were in Texas. So while it was an established brand, it did not have name recognition. We opened the first one in Texas. So that's not always going to be the case. And especially here in DFW, brands sell out really quickly. So by the time they have brand recognition here, there may not be any territory left. But certainly there should be a proven business system. They're, they are going to provide training and support. Now, not all franchises are created equal. As I mentioned, there are nearly 4,000. So good franchises are going to provide uh, training and support. They historically have a lower failure rate because of some of these things that we're talking about here. Um, I know lower cost may seem a little bit of a surprise to you. But when you pay your franchise fee and your royalties, you're bypassing some of that trial and error. So at the end of the day, uh, it could be a lower cost for you to get up and running. Um, because of the way uh, franchises are structured and because they have a lower failure rate, they're going to have more financing options. Franchises are regulated by the Federal Trade Commission. So they also provide a disclosure document that is not available with independent businesses. So we'll talk about what's included in that disclosure document here in a minute, but you are, they are required to document things um, that an independent business owner is not required to document. So it's very uh, much 
easier access to the information you need to make the right decision for you. Um, I would say my favorite advantage to a franchise is the franchise family. Other franchisees that are seeking to accomplish the same thing you want to accomplish, but they're not competitors, you can collaborate, you can brainstorm. And I do that with my colleagues. I had a conversation with one of mine this morning. I was driving back from a networking meeting and we were just chatting about ideas and ways to improve our businesses. And he is in Nashville, Tennessee. So we're not competing and we just work together to, I was sharing with him some of the um, marketing efforts that we'd done that he might wanna try. Uh, some disadvantages, you're gonna have fewer industry options. So some of these, what I would call Shark Tank ideas, um, are not necessarily proven yet to be in a franchise. So some people might find some of the options that we've discussed, like cleaning and damage restoration, maybe a little boring, but certainly uh, they can be proven. Franchises are going to be structured. Not all franchises are structure, as structured as others. Certainly if it is a newer or an emerging brand, they sometimes tend to be less structured, but there is there should be some structure and organization in that franchise. You are going to have territory restrictions. You're in most cases, not 100%, but the majority are going to have zip codes, a mileage radius, something that is your defined territory. You can only sell their products. So if you happen to have a retail uh, business or a restaurant, they have a brand to protect. So you're not able to go in and just sell a product um, or some food item off of their menus. And you are going to have ongoing royalties. You are going to be paying them, in most cases, a percentage of your gross revenue. Now, in some cases, it is a flat royalty, but most of the brands that we work with you're paying a percentage. And we'll talk about why that um, somebody might choose to do that here in a, in a minute. But basically, you just have to think of those royalties as a trade-off. So I know we just covered a lot of information. I'll pause for just one second and see if anybody has any questions that you would like to enter in the Q&A box before I move on. All right, I will move on. So really the definition is fairly simple. A franchise is just a license to use that company's name, trademarks, product systems in exchange for that initial franchise fee and those ongoing royalties. So that franchise disclosure document that we talked about, this is not a good document to read if you happen to be really sleepy um, it is a good document to read if you have insomnia and need to try to fall asleep. And the reason that I say that truly is because they're written by attorneys, no offense to attorneys, but um, they are written by attorneys and there's a lot of legalese in this document. But here are some of the key takeaways. Um, you're going to find out how long that franchise has been in business. What is the business experience of their leadership? Have there been any bankruptcies? Has there been any litigation? They are required to report that. An independent business is not required to report that. So if a franchise brand has been around for quite a while, chances are they've had some litigation. So you're going to want to find out what it is. You know, why is somebody suing somebody else and decide if you feel like that's a concern or a deal breaker for you? What are your total costs to get in to this franchise? Um, really important if you are someone who has maybe been looking online at opportunities, I get worried um, on these lists where best franchise for this or that or whatever. I don't really know what criteria they use for best, but a lot of times the only dollar amount that they're showing you is their franchise fee. And that is not all that's going to be required to get your business up and running. You are going to need working capital. Um, I'll go back to our gym example. We did pre-sales for six weeks before we opened our doors while they were finishing construction. But we were paying staff to sell those memberships. So that's an example of some working capital. 
we were advertising, we were marketing, we were letting people know, hey, this gym is going to be opening. I think we did some direct mail. We were all over social media. Uh, so those things are going to be required. You're going to have build out potentially if you have a facility, you might have equipment. If you have a business that's serving someone at their business or at their home, you might have a vehicle. If it's lawn care, for example, you might have um, that equipment, mosquito control. You might have licensing required for pest control. So there's going to be other costs outside of your franchise fee to get your business up and running. And of course, those royalties will be listed there as well. Also, the franchise contract. And that contract will explain what the obligations are from that franchisor to you as a franchisee and what are your obligations as a franchisee? What, are, what is expected from you? So sometimes that might mean uh, a marketing investment every month. For FranNet, um, they are now requiring that each new uh, office owner, each new franchisee has an assistant of some kind working with them. They don't want all uh, of our owners to be trying to do everything ourselves. You can't scale a business when you want to do that uh, or when you try to do that. The territory will be outlined in this agreement. Um, you will find a list of current franchisees and past franchisees, and this is invaluable because this is your opportunity to really get a feel for what a day in the life of, a, of, a, of an owner of that particular brand is. We call that validation. And that's an extremely important step in doing your due diligence. Some franchisors have earnings claims, certainly not all, but some are listed there, financial statements, and all of your policies are listed in this franchise disclosure document. I've seen them be as few as 100 pages up to four to 500 pages. If, they, they, if they're that long, they are likely a, a business that has been around for a while. They might have some litigation um, and they likely could have um, you know, a, a strong number of franchisees which are listed in that document. So it makes it more pages. Okay, uh, Vandela is asking, how is the buy-in price determined by the franchise business? So I hope I understand your question. If I'm not answering it, please um, clarify. But each franchisor um, is going to define their franchise fee in some manner. And to be honest, I'm not really sure how they decide. I have seen them um, range from, I don't know, 15 to 20,000 up to maybe 50,000 for one territory. And honestly, how they come up with that number, I am not sure what they're basing that on. So I'm sorry that I don't have a more definitive answer for you, but they do vary. I would say a lot of that's going to depend on the type of business that it is. Okay. So we talked about those conversations with current and past franchisees. And this is just a key differentiator, as I've mentioned before, in a franchise versus doing something on your own. And it's an opportunity to allow this extensive research utilizing past results, which I think is really, uh, really important. Okay, so we are going to play a little game here. Is it a myth? Or a fact. So since everyone is muted, I'm going to just get you to uh, think about it to yourself and not ask you to answer out loud. But franchising is only fast food and retail. Now, I think this one's pretty easy because we've already discussed a lot of the industries that are thriving. So that is a myth. Um, I've mentioned it a couple times, but the number of franchises that are out there there's 300 different categories with nearly 700,000 operating units. So as you can see, this moves well beyond fast food and retail. So myth or fact, franchises succeed because of the quality of the product. So I have to have the best hamburger out there in order to have a successful business. And that is also a myth. 
So um, I would venture to guess that if somebody is craving a hamburger, their first choice might not be McDonald's, but it is about the marketing and the sale and the operation. And I believe a lot of that falls in. A lot of people will tell me consistency. You know, if you've got a family and everybody's hungry and you're on a road trip and you see that McDonald's, you know what you're going to get there. There's no surprises, hopefully, and um, there shouldn't be. And you don't have, if you know your children like it, that can be a key reason to go there. That could be marketing. I know when my children were younger, sometimes um, I would choose a place just because uh, of the playground that they had, because I needed a break um, and let them run around either inside or out. Or maybe it was whatever toy might be in the kid's uh, meal. So that all kind of ties into marketing. Hey, Sarah. I'm going yes. to um, I'm going to uh, enable the chat for this portion of your session so then they can discuss your myth or fact in the chat. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so here's the next one. There are low cost franchise opportunities. So I know that low cost also means different things to different people. They have a different definition of low cost. But let's talk about some of those investment ranges. Okay, so we've got one myth and one fact. Very good. So the truth is that is a fact. And I think, again, it kind of comes back to what your definition of low cost might be. But when I joined FranNet over 10 years ago, I was of the mindset that most people are today, that it's half a million dollars, it's brick and mortar. But as you can see, only 28% of franchises are over 500,000 and over 50% are in the one to 500,000 range. And there are 7% that are under 50,000. And certainly uh, another percentage, they're a little bit larger at 13% between 50 and 100,000. And those numbers, let me clarify, are your all-in investment. That's not just franchise fee. That's what it would take to get your business up and running. So how would one decide to fund a business? This is always a question that is top of mind. So certainly if you have that money and personal savings, that can be an excellent uh, way to get started, but not everybody's gonna have that. And honestly, my CPA would tell you um, to use somebody else's money. And certainly, you know, you're going to have to have some sort of cash injection of your own. But I never uh, encourage anybody to use all of their personal savings. You've got to have a cushion there for emergencies. That makes me very uncomfortable for somebody to wipe out their savings account to fund a business. I'm going to caution you a little bit about this next one with friends, relatives, and partners. Um, you know, I'll have people tell me that they want to have a silent partner. That person is just going to be funding the business for them. But when somebody's putting out the money, silent is generally not what they tend to be. And we kind of jokingly refer to the golden rule in this scenario. When I was raised, the golden rule was do unto others as you would have them do unto you. However, in this scenario, the one with the gold makes the rules. So keep that in mind if you're thinking, oh, well, I'm going to go into a partnership or a silent partnership and I'm going to run the business and this other person is going to invest. Um, we, my colleague Roxanne that I introduced uh, and I host a podcast and next week we, it's called Unpredicted Entrepreneur. So I would invite you to find that where you listen to your podcast. Um, it's also on our YouTube channel, but anyway, next week we are interviewing uh, a, an attorney that specializes in business partnerships, business entities. And he's got a lot of great stories. We chatted with him yesterday to kind of prepare. Um, and so many times People have a good friend or a family member and they want to go into business and they think they're on the same page. But unfortunately, 
things can happen unexpectedly. So if you're going to go into a partnership, you want to make sure that you have a partnership agreement written up by an attorney. And so if you listen to our episode in a few weeks, you'll get a lot more insight on that. Um, home equity line of credit. That's been a path uh, clients have started to, started to take these days. Home values have uh, definitely increased and people are finding uh, the opportunity to use some of that home equity as a strong way to, to fund a business. We talked about potentially seller financing. And then this last option is one that many people are not familiar with, but you can take retirement funds. If you have an IRA, maybe with uh, an Ameriprise Financial or Charles Schwab, uh, you can roll that into a C corporation to fund a business. If you have a 401k that is from a former employer, so it cannot be your employer presently uh, where you are contributing and they're likely matching in some form, you cannot use those funds. But if you have funds sitting out uh, from a previous employer or an IRA, the, the IRS developed this program. It's been around for over 30 years. It's completely legal. And you actually are rolling those funds into a C corporation, buying stock in your own company. So you're kind of essentially taking them out of the stock market, buying stock in your own company. Uh, there are no taxes. There are no penalties through the IRS. However, there are uh, fees associated with it. And those companies that I mentioned at the beginning of this webinar specialize in that, and we can certainly help you uh, find out more about that. So here's another one. You don't need industry experience. What are your thoughts on this topic? All right, that is a fact. Okay, we had one answer. Yes. Fact, fact, very good. Um, so this is a surprise to a lot of people, but the reality is that franchisors want people who will use their system, who are going to focus on being an owner. They want you to have management skills, communication, leadership, operations. Those are the things that are very hard for them to train. Franchisors can train you on their system. And a lot of times, if you are coming to that business with previous experience in that industry, you might have kind of what we call head trash. And what I mean by that is, well, we've always done it this way. This is the way I always learned to do it. And it might be harder for you to adapt to the way this franchisor has developed their successful franchise. I remember distinctly a client from 2013 who was an auto mechanic and he moved here from New York to create a better life for his family, but all he knew was auto mechanics and wanted to run his own mechanic shop. But that's really not what franchisors are looking for in their owners. They, there's concern that that owner would be down uh, you know, in the garage, underneath the vehicle, doing the repairs themselves. And they need that owner to be doing the hiring and the HR and the marketing. Um, and so that really is, was not a fit. And it was hard for me to tell him that that really wasn't going to be the best path for him to take. So think about a franchise being a great fit for you when it's really just a means of getting you to your destination while helping you meet your financial and lifestyle goals. Think of it as a way to hopefully reduce risk and create income security versus job security. And that's a big topic for people right now is really how to build and create wealth and income security. We talked before about royalties and the reality is they're gonna be a trade-off. You're gonna exchange some of your long-term profits for some of that risk reduction in the short term. Uh, the reality is most good franchisors lose money in the short term. Uh, because um, of the training and what they're investing in getting you and your business as a new franchisee up and running. So you really need to think of this as a partnership. And if you're successful, then they're going to be successful, especially if you're paying a percentage of your earnings. A good franchisor is going to want you to do well and be successful. And so that's a win-win for everyone. So I have no... 
uh, problem paying my franchisor the royalties that I owe them because of the support that I receive from them. But I've said it before and I'll say it again, not all franchises are created equal. I have a brother-in-law that owns um, a franchise in Dallas and he has told me that his franchisor does not do anything for them. So again, that's something that's a really good thing to learn as you are doing your due diligence and having your conversations with franchisees. Okay, so when you're thinking about a franchise and a system, here's what you want to hopefully accomplish through a system. And if it's a good system, uh, I heard an acrostic for that word that I've never forgotten, and it's saving yourself significant time, energy, and money. So think about as you're doing your due diligence with diligence with that franchise and the systems that they have in place, will those enable you to save yourself significant time, energy, and money? One thing that I think is wonderful that I'm learning from these franchisors is what they're doing with technology. It's very impressive. And as an independent business owner, it can oftentimes take a lot longer to get that figured out on your own versus being able to utilize what the franchisor has set out for you. And I um, mentioned before the franchise family, and that just ties in to the culture of teamwork. As you are exploring opportunities, you're looking for a culture fit. You're looking for a brand where you trust the leadership and you trust and would enjoy uh, collaborating and utilizing the resources available for you, both through the franchisor and other franchisees. So as you've probably learned here, franchises are not all the same. Some have a lot, some have few. If they have few, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with them. They just may not have as aggressive of a growth strategy as another brand. Not everybody's, like I said, is seeking to, seeking to accomplish the same thing. So some have been around longer than others. Obviously, we talked about some being more structured than others. This is extremely important, and I forgot to mention this before when we were talking about investment range, and I really hope that this sticks with you. There is no correlation between the cost of the franchise and the potential return. So we always talk about you need to spend money to make money, but just be aware you do not necessarily need to spend more money to make more money. There's just truly no correlation. And some of them that maybe don't have brick and mortar uh, may have less overhead and could have a higher ROIs. I'm not gonna read you all of this, but I just think that this is an interesting slide um, where you can truly see the imp economic impact of franchises in Texas. I mean, 635,000 jobs in Texas, uh, over 62,000 establishments, 21, over 21 billion in payroll, and obviously a huge contribution to the GDP. So one thing that we like to say in franchising is you're in business for yourself, but not by yourself. So if you're looking for that perfect fit, ask yourself these questions. Are you willing to follow that franchise or system? If you are not, don't buy that franchise. Uh, don't go in there and think, oh, I'm going to change this. I'm going I'm to change that. If you are not willing to follow their systems, you don't have confidence, you should go a different path, either a different franchise or start something on your own. Make sure that you have enough financial resources to cover your expenses for at least six months, maybe up to a year. Don't, um, don't get yourself undercapitalized. Make sure you're comfortable with the risk level and make sure you'll enjoy your business. That's really important. You want to be able to wake up and enjoy what you're going to do every day. What is the role of that owner? That's extremely important as well. So think again about what you're seeking to accomplish through the franchise. We really encourage our clients to think about what you want the business to do for you and try not to focus on what the business does. How can you best utilize your skills to accomplish your goals and think less about what the business actually does. This is where a lot of people make mistakes. They get enamored with a product or a service and they don't have an understanding of who the staff might be to run that business, um, what kind of hours they might be needing. And, you know, maybe they have young children and they like a certain kind of food. Um, and those two things just may not align. 
So if you would like to learn more and see if there is a fit for you, FriendNet uses an assessment tool to help us get to know you, understand your strengths, your goals, your motivations, and see if we can help find the right opportunity for you. Um, we build you a business model with you together. We build a business model and get you thinking about how many employees do you want? I did not have management experience when I came to FranNet and I actually forgot to share. I had spent 10 and a half years at at and and then I took time off to raise my children. And then I was also with a startup. So I had seen both sides of the spectrum, but I had never been in management. So I knew I didn't want a lot of employees. Think about what budget you're working with, what type of environment you want for your business. How much time do you want to put in? Do you want to be a full-time owner operator or do you want to be what we call semi-absentee where you might manage the manager? How many locations do you want? Do you want repeat business? So our gyms, I know I use that as an example a lot, but we're membership based. So we have recurring revenue. But if you have a business like I mentioned earlier, which is damage restoration, those are high profits, but those are usually one and done. So who do you want your clients to be? How much room for expansion do you want? Do you want to sell a product? Do you want to sell a service? Think about what your transferable skills are and how you can use those in the business and what you might need to hire out for. We always say, focus on your highest and best use. I cannot stress enough the importance. I think as business owners, we try to wear a lot of hats, but we need to focus on where our strengths lie and hire others to, to do what their strengths are. And we even talked about outsourcing some of these roles if you don't need that person full time. Think about not only how you want to get in, but how you want to get out of business. How long do you want to be in that business? And what is your exit strategy? Do you want to build something that you would pass down to children? Do you want to build an asset to sell? Okay, back to those professional advisors. Within your company, you need to hire people that are good at what they do and those services that you need, but you also need to hire advisors as you are exploring these opportunities. So, it's important that you hire a franchise attorney. And I know one of the sessions you are going to have a fabulous franchise attorney. I'm not sure if it's next week or the following week. His name is Carlos White. He's amazing. Um, their attorneys are like doctors. They all have their area of expertise. Do not hire a, you know, um, a family law attorney to review your franchise agreement. That you want someone who understands franchising. I placed an attorney a couple of years ago in a pet uh, grooming business and he hired a franchise attorney. He said, I don't read these documents every day. This is not my line of work. I want somebody that can point out red flags and is familiar with these documents. Um, these are some really good books that I recommend as well. The E-Myth Revisited is focused more on business ownership in general. The other two, more than just French fries and street smart, street smart franchising are um, uh, franchise related. So if you would like to complete our entrepreneur profile, you can go to frannet.com and find it there. Uh, enter your zip code as part of that, and that will determine if this, um, if your profile goes to Roxanne or myself. We kind of have the Metroplex divided up geographically. So um, if, that, if you would like to see if there's a way that uh, we can help you find the right franchise fit, that would be your next step. And here is our contact information. I am about a minute and a half over. Uh, it's 1231, but thank you guys so much for your attention. And I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. You can put them in the Q&A or um, whatever Kay suggests in terms of uh, asking questions today. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. We can put them in the chat or the Q&A. Perfect. Those who may still have questions. And briefly, just to discuss the franchise um, initiative for the, the coming up franchises. Let me stop sharing. Can you stop sharing really quick, Sarah, so I can share oh, with you. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, you're fine. You're fine. Okay. And there it is. There's the information on the upcoming franchise sessions. Next week, we will have uh, Carlos White, 
who will be our legal essentials of franchising, followed by funding, and then the in-person uh, discussion that I mentioned earlier. Did we have a question? It's just a um, to you. Just thank you. So um, yeah, happy to help any of you however I can. I, as you can tell, I uh, enjoy um, speaking about franchising. And so please reach out um, whatever path you might want to reach out. Happy to connect with you all on LinkedIn as well. I'm very active on LinkedIn. So it's a good resource for learning more about franchising there. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you. You all will receive a, um, a survey to, um, to in order for you to give Sarah your feedback and give us your feedback as well for going forward. Uh, you will receive a link to the recording. Um, and Sarah, will this presentation be accessible to them? Um, if they would like the uh, presentation, please invite them to contact me and I okay. will be happy. I can send a recorded version. I mean, you recorded it, so you yes, could send yes, that yes, too, yeah. um, but I can also send the slides. So okay. whatever um, they might like, I know that um, sometimes you might want to share it with a spouse yes. um, if you're thinking about doing that. So happy to send that out as well. Okay, great. So I will send the follow-up email to all the attendees as well as those who registered and were not able to attend. Please, please, please take the survey and I look forward to seeing you all in the coming weeks for our future Franchise You sessions. Thanks Thank you, again. Have you a bet. Y'all have a great day.